So myself and three other members of the planning club will ask questions. Let me introduce to you the questioners. First of all, uh, Mr. Kuji uh, Akio, Chair of the Editorial Committee of the Nihon Keita Shinbu Newspaper Company, Mr. Kurosawa uh, of uh, the Asahi Newspaper Company, Ms. Moto Mura of Mainichi Newspaper Company, and Mr. Hari Ma of uh, TBS Television. My name is Hoji of Nihon Keita Shinbu. Thank you so much, Minister, for joining us. So. On behalf of the team, I would like to start lead off the question. In particular, I would like to start with a question about the COVID-19 countermeasures. Would that be agreeable? May I? Well, thank you. As far as Taiwan is concerned, ever since COVID-19 began last year, Taiwan was known for being successful in containing and controlling COVID-19. Your country was praised for the control of COVID-19. But in the recent days, we see some news that are of concern to us in the recent days. It seems that there is a spread, further spread of the virus once again. So how do you see the recent expansion of the infection in your country? How do you see the current situation? And what countermeasures are you taking? According to the recent news, I understand that you're developing a new tool to contact, to trace contact persons. And you did this in a very short period of time. Can you share that information with us? Thank you so much. Minister, please. Thank you. Um, just to check that uh, my voice is uh, okay for you to listen. Okay, excellent. Um, thank you for the great question. Uh, indeed, uh, last week we rolled out the new contact tracing tool, the 1922 SMS. 1922 has been instrumental in being the toll-free number since last January that has received more than 2 million calls that ask for real-time clarifications that report um, emerging issues like the pink mask uh, and so on. Uh, everything was done through the toll-free number which received more than 2 million calls last year. And this year, uh, in light of the recent uh, spike, we made sure that 1922 is not just a toll-free number to call, but also a toll-free number to SMS. Adding to that, we make sure that all the different uh, places has this QR code for checking in, so people just scan it and does not need to type anything or install any app, and just by pressing send can check in to the toll-free number 1922, which in effect is stored in whichever telecom the person is holding. And this ensures that the data privacy and cybersecurity measures that existing telecoms provide is already in place. Instead of trusting a third party processor on the internet, which has any number of midpoints, we made sure that we use the SMS protocol so no internet connectivity is necessary. Whichever telecom that a person is associated with now receive the uh, random generated code symbolizing the place. But the place address or the um, registration number and so on is not stored in the telecom's database. And in that way, the telecom keeps it for 28 days before having to delete it by contract. And so because of that, the telecom has no incentive to sell the data to advisors or anything because the data is entirely randomized and uh, anonymized beyond the uh, SMS number. I take uh, the time to explain in technical detail because we were able to design this with the leading developers of the mask rationing team, GovZero, the original band of people who rolled out mask rationing about one year ago. So uh, with the existing mutual trust and the existing infrastructure for 1922, the toll-free number on one side and the mass rationing on the other, we were able to complete this development in just 24 hours and then testing for another 24 hours. And then we announced on the third day. Thank you. Last year, the mass version team was started up and the same team developed a new tool. Is that team outside the government or inside the government? In Japan, there's a plan by the government to establish the digital affairs agency. So there's much interest on this topic. So what was the decision making process and what kind of a team is this? This is what I call a people public 
private partnership. The people or the social sector, as in the GovZero community, the G0V community, a open source, open innovation community, first tackled the mask map. So the map is not invented by people in the government like me. It's invented by Howard Wu in Tainan, and later on, uh, Fin Zheng Kiang also in Tainan. And so they made a crowdsourcing map to display mask availability. But they set a norm that people really like. So the government's role here is what I describe as reverse procurement. The specification is done by the social sector, by the civic technologist. But we make sure that the API for providing the mask availability is robust, is refreshed every 30 seconds, it's secure, cybersecurity wise, and so on. And then we work with more convenience store chains and so on in the private sector to also implement the same protocol so that not just pharmacies, but also convenience stores and vending machines and so on can join this uh, norm that's set by the social sector. The importance of this is that the social sector, like a swarm, can experiment thousands of different uh, designs and converge very rapidly on one or two designs that made sense to the broad public. If the government used that as the specification, it's much more likely that whatever policy and infrastructure we rolled out will get public acceptance because it's already tested, tried and true in the social sector. So this time, the 1922 SMS underwent exactly the same process. It's designed by um, a couple of people in the GovZero community, primarily Ace Chen and Piju Chen, uh, and they prototyped the simple system, of course not using 1922, using their own phone number. And then we implemented this design and talked to the five telecom to waive the SMS fee. And then, of course, we worked on popularizing it with um, people who are convenience stores, uh, who run their own shops, even night markets and so on, who can all issue and print their own QR code. And because it takes less than five seconds to complete a check-in compared to uh, pen and paper, this is actually faster to most people. So people voluntarily adopt it. If we design a specification that would take 10 seconds or 20 seconds, of course, even if we do it in a top-down way, the private sector would not accept. But the idea that it takes less than five seconds, that comes from the social sector. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you are the minister responsible for di uh, digital, and you introduced a new tool and have taken countermeasures. Now, in reality, with the spread of COVID-19 in the recent days in your, in your country, well, correction, the many companies that have stopped holding shareholders, shareholders meetings and also many classes are now turning to online classes. How do you see the impact on the Taiwanese economy? For example, how do you see the impact of the capacity utilization of the semiconductor factories in Taiwan? This has relevance on the future Japan. But how do you see the impact on the Taiwanese economy? And what about the outlook for elimination and eradication of COVID-19 going forward in the face of the recent expansion of the spread? In the short term, we have seen impact, of course, on the social sector, uh, as well as the service industries. Uh, and we have applied for extra budget. Uh, the extra budget act is now in the parliament and we will send a budget uh, shortly after to make sure that people can uh, be taken care of during this time of level three. But level three uh, measures does not mean that we stopped uh, going to work. It means that teleworking is preferred but for the manufacturing industry, where going to the plants and so on are still required, level three is not a lockdown. We do not, for example, prohibit commuting and so on. Uh, only if, instead of the curve being mostly flat, as we see in the past week, it, if it spikes, of course, we might have to go to the level four, which will have real impact 
on the uh, production manufacturing industry. But if we continue on the level three measures and the curve uh, remains flat or even going slightly downward as we expect because um, this is a lagging indicator, right? We announce level three and then if it does work, then we expect the curve to go slightly down. If that happens, then I expect that the manufacturing industry will remain relatively unharmed. So level three was mentioned. Another point, this has become a hot topic in Japan, and that is vaccination for COVID-19. Taiwan was successful in initial response, so Taiwan was successful in containing the number of uh, those who test positive. But on the other hand, like uh, Japan, your vaccination rate against the total population is uh, remains at about 0.9%, and Taiwan seems to be behind in terms of vaccination. But I'm sure many measures are in mind with regards to vaccination. But what are the lessons learned with regards to vaccination? What do you regret, and what are your views on vaccination going forward? What should you be doing? When I get vaccinated uh, in April, mid-April, um, people around me, uh, I try to tell them to vaccinate as early as possible. But most of them said they would rather wait until July uh, when the homegrown vaccine, uh, which is um, should be quite safe, although the final numbers uh, is not out yet and effective. Uh, and they said, well, we will wait for that instead of going uh, for AstraZeneca. Well, that has changed now. Uh, all the vaccination spots and so on are fully booked. Uh, and so I would say that indeed, you can say because for most of the last year, we do not really have a pandemic situation. And uh, for example, the school never stopped until last week. Uh, and so there's no urgency to get vaccinated uh, in people's minds. And therefore, if we push any very stringent top-down way to get people vaccinated, uh, the compliance risk uh, is actually quite high. Uh, but since the past week, of course, the vaccination willingness is no longer a problem. And we do uh, see pretty good progress in not just getting uh, the overseas COVAX vaccines, but also the homegrown um, production is showing pretty good uh, trends. So I think, um, I wouldn't say it's a regret, but I uh, was having a real difficulty uh, mid-April <laughs> convincing my friends and family to get vaccinated. I see. So in your country, the people, to, to have, is there likelihood to be able to secure sufficient uh, vaccines to cover all the population in Taiwan? Have you procured that? Um, our existing procurement, I believe, uh, covers uh, 30 million jabs or so. Uh, and of course, the homegrown vaccines uh, there's two uh, in phase two right now. So if uh, one of them, and we expect both of them, uh, prove to be okay to use, uh, then we can, of course, procure extra uh, from the two domestic producers. In Japan, vaccination has begun and the booking system faced many problems bugs. And even in various countermeasures against COVID-19 measures, cash transfer was not smoothly done, and digitalization did not proceed smoothly. And because of those problems, the government is working to establish a digital affairs agency. And I'm sure you asked many questions from Japanese journalists, and you've been interviewed by Japanese media company, Ministry of Return. But as you uh, observe, the situation in Japan, like the, the lagging digitalization, you said the trust of the government is important, but how do you currently view the situation in Japan today? In our experience rolling out uh, both the mask rationing and the 1922 SMS, we found that being inclusive is really important. When we roll out, for example, convenience store uh, prepaid uh, mask ordering, we did not 
take away the pharmacy uh, rationing, the queuing, because many local elderly people already trust the pharmacists uh, to support them in, for example, uh, getting them the recurring subscription uh, drugs. And uh, for example, in 1922 SMS, we, we do not force people to use the SMS system. People who simply do not have a phone with them can still use pen and paper to write down their contact number. Uh, and that's still legal, that's still valid. We're not saying that you have to be digitized. We're saying we are rolling out a system that's considerably quicker than pen and paper. And also, uh, the more people use the SMS check-in, the less people use the pen and paper, the less risk for people to you know, crowd through the pen and paper registration form and therefore reduce the chance of infection. So uh, the SMS using people also help the pen and paper using people. Um, so my experience has been uh, not focusing on uh, replacing pen and paper, but developing something that's less risky, that is um, faster, that builds more trust than pen and paper. And then the digitalization is quite automatic. In the past week or so, the top uh, free downloaded apps in the tools category in the Google Play Store, I just checked this morning. Uh, first was the Cocoa-like Bluetooth uh, cont uh, exposure not notification system, the Taiwan Social Distancing app. But the second uh, is a free QR code scanner. Uh, so obviously, people help each other, even the very elderly people, to get uh, the tool they need. Uh, to facilitate digital transformation, but they do so at their own pace with their own network instead of uh, feeling that they're being forced to do that. I see. Well, here in Japan, with a good deal such as that, the elderly population, they're not able to utilize the network and the digital technology, so that's a problem for them. And also, you talked about contact tracing earlier. For example, you mentioned that uh, even in restaurants, you are going to leave your information behind. And there's a sense of people that are quite sensitive about leaving personal data. It, it, it will burst down to the trust you have between the people and the government. What are your feelings about this matter? Any thoughts on this matter? Yes, and this is why we designed the 1922 system so the data is stored not in the government, but in the telecom. There is a difference because in the five telecoms, people have a choice. People do choose the telecom that they trust more or at least more familiar with. So almost by definition, if you have a phone and you use a certain telecoms offering, you probably trust it at least as much or more than other telecoms. So because of that, by deciding to say, let's have a contract with the five telecoms where we procure not the data, but the ability to build a system to respond to contact tracing queries uh, and keep the data in a specific purpose, not using it for anything else than contact tracing and destroy the data if no contact tracer has looked at it in the past 28 days. This is very, very important because this is the assurance, the same assurance, for example, your pharmacist have when you give them your national health card. They also assure you that they will not, for example, uh, sell your data to advertise because by law, the national health card can only be used for public service this way. And the pharmacists have also uh, have to use their own business uh, IC card uh, to make sure that there is an audit trail in the app that everybody can check who has uh, make use of the National Health Card. So using the National Health app, uh, everybody can see when was the last dentist visit, when was the last doctor visit, when was the last uh, rapid testing or RT-PCR testing, was the result, uh, and so on and so forth, vaccination result, right? The fact I was vaccinated, I can look it up on the app very quickly. And uh, when people see that whatever written to the data could be, uh, um, over, could be subject to oversight later by the individual offering this data, the trustworthiness is gradually built so that people understand it will not be used uh, for extra um, purpose uses. The Japanese government 
also is explaining that they will place weight on privacy matters, but it's not really persuasive to the general public. But in order for the government to gain trust from the general public, what is necessary in this area? What's the most important thing? The most important thing is not forcing people to use it. So if at the end you don't trust the telecoms either, well, you just use pen and paper. So instead of saying pe to people that you have to trust the telecom or you have to trust um, the government or you have to trust your municipality or whatever, we offer an extra choice. So if you trust your telecom, for example, use the SMS. But if you don't, but you trust the business owner, well, you can leave your name card there, right? And say, call me when this place, um, you know, uh, confirms that somebody uh, that enters the shop the same day uh, has test positive. You, you can still do that. That is still legal. I see. Okay. One, uh, one other question about democracy and digitalization. I was just about the democracy and digitalization. Now, under the pandemic of COVID-19, relatively, relatively speaking, countries such as China and authoritarian countries seem to have been more successful in controlling COVID-19 compared to some democracies. Now, Taiwan is a democratic nation, but that type of view is now spreading. On the other hand, with the digital transformation, SNS has developed, and some say that the spread of SNS has led to information, the spread of disinformation and rumors, and as a result, this could undermine democracy. That type of argument is also seen. So, so digital transformation and democracy. What is the end of you, Minister? How do you see the relations between the two? I it's think the biggest question I don't understand, but please, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So let me just check the question. The first one is whether democracy is a liability or a plus when it comes to counter pandemic. And the second question asks the same thing, but on the infodemic, which includes disinformation and misinformation and malinformation. That, that's right, right? Okay. Um, I think in Taiwan, democracy is definitely a plus. Without a democracy, without the freedom of speech association experiment, we would not have a social sector that come up with the design of the mask map or the 1922 SMS system, right? Because these are not from the government. These are from the civil society, from the people who are free to experiment. Had we had not a democracy, we would not have the early warning from the PTT, the Taiwanese equivalent of Reddit, but it's not really like Reddit because for the past 25 years, the PTT has been open source, open governance, subsidized by National Taiwan University, but run quite independently, uh, having no advertisers nor shareholders. And so it's in the social sector. So without a thriving social sector, we would not have the advanced warning. We would not have the collective intelligence. We would not have humor over rumor. Uh, and so all these would not be possible without democracy. So Taiwan model depends on democracy, on universal broadband, and universal healthcare. These are the three foundations of the Taiwan model. Now, when it comes to the infodemic, which is defined by the WHO as, and I quote, too much information, including false or misleading information during a disease outbreak, end of quote. Um, I think the infodemic is not particular to SNS. Indeed, the WHO observed that there's digital infodemic, uh, also physical infodemic. The rumors do not spread only on the SNS, but also on many other platforms. For example, on the end-to-end -end encrypted chat channels, WhatsApp or Line. Uh, is actually a place where a lot of infodemic spreads as well, as well as, of course, on non-digital ways. And again, we engage the public and utilize the freedom of speech to make sure that there are interesting, clever, funny ways to dispel the disinformation by uh, bracketing the disinformation into a frame, and then outside, we provide some context saying, this is not true, and the reason it's not true, we present it in a funny way. So this is uh, a little bit like how vaccinations work. You show your immune system uh, the entire virus or the important part of the virus, 
and then you tell your immune system how to manufacture antibodies, but uh, you do not actually um, uh, harm your body, right? It's uh, in a sense deactivated. Uh, and so we use the same idea, like human over rumor, against infodemic, just like we counter the pandemic. Thank you very much. We are currently at Japan National Press Club, which is an association of journalists. So, digitalization and journalism, or digital transformation and journalism, is another topic we would like to ask you. With digital transformation, uh, journalism is encountering change, and printed uh, newspaper subscription circulation is drastically coming down. On the other hand, uh, digital newspaper is going up. Digital transformation versus journalism. What is the role of journalism in the age of digital transformation? Um, when I was young, um, I've learned the word democratization means that everybody can participate. But nowadays, the English word democratization have come to mean something like it's inexpensive or it's very easy to access. Uh, so I think journalism should be democratized in the first sense, in the last century sense. Um, that is to say, people can become journalists and uh, receive journalistic training and think in a way that respect the sources, check the sources, uh, aware of the framing, uh, providing context, and so on. All the important skills that the journalists have are essential in our digital competence curriculum, in our basic education. That is to say, instead of saying that primary schoolers need to have media literacy, which is about being consumers, Right when you're uh, listening to radio or watching television, we, we talk about literacy because there's literally nothing else you can do except being literate about it. But nowadays, with universal broadband, which is bidirectional, everybody can provide important contextualizing service. Everybody can check some sources and even start live streaming and join fact checkers and so on. And so in a sense, everybody can contribute to journalism and so the professional journalists are like the people who are teachers to the, not just primary school, but everybody in the society to contribute to journalism by doing their part in democratizing journalism. Thank you. So we have a major role to play. Thank you for that. So that's all for my questions. I would like to turn to the other three panelists on the podium. So I would like to invite my colleagues to ask questions now from the podium. Thank you, if I may. My name is Kurosawa from Asahi Shinbu newspaper. Thank you so much for this opportunity. So I would like to ask two questions about COVID-19. This goes back to the relations between uh, democracy and digitalization. So the, the relationship of trust between the government here in Japan, this is something that we don't understand being able to trust the government or relationship based on trust. You mentioned that people should not be forced. That's what you mentioned. But I think maybe you could say that because, was it because the government in place has enjoys a very high approval rate or was it an inherent high level of trust for the government and the civil servants? What is the baseline? What was it like before in Taiwan? Can you talk about that, please? Thank you. Certainly. Um, to give no trust is to get no trust. In 2014, uh, when we occupied the parliament during the Sunflower Movement, um, sometime that year, I think the approval rate was something like 9% or so uh, to the government. So it was really low. Uh, and the reason was not just because the people was angry or was upset or whatever, but because people perceive that the government did not trust the people to participate in policy making. And so people receive a already made policy without much deliberation or discussion or any room for co-creation. And so whenever we make sure that people's contribution can appear early, that is to say when we're still ideating when we're still trying to figure out the best way forward, when at that time people can participate and set the agenda, 
then it means the government trusts the people. And some people, of course, trust back. Some people, of course, don't trust back and choose to hold us to account. And they are very important contributors too. And we thank them for it. But my point is that without trusting people to co-create, then you lose even the part of the people that would have trusted back. And that is the most important part, which is why for people who complain about any government services, we always say now that, well, it's everyone's business, so it requires everyone's help. Well, if you can help design it, show us your prototype, and we will adopt if it actually proves to be better. In 2017, uh, a designer petitioned uh, against our tax filing system, saying it's, and I quote, explosively hostile, and end of quote. Uh, and instead of defending the policy, we just ask everybody who complained to co-create a tax filing experience of 2018. And that won 96% approval rate, not because it's a particularly good design, it's pretty good, but because thousands of people contributed. And they now say, what well, the tax filing experience, we design it, not the government. And that led to a higher trust rate. The system will later on be adjusted because it's based on API, so like Lego blocks, be adjusted a little bit and became the mass creationing pre-ordering system. And later on, it will get adjusted a little bit and become the stimulus voucher pre-registering system. And this time, just a couple of weeks ago, it got adjusted a little bit and became, well, the 1922 SMS QR code making system. So a co-creation can benefit not just the Ministry of Finance and the tax agency, but pretty much everybody who co-created, which includes public servants in other agencies. That's persuasive, it's, but it's difficult. Go together, in a way. Government can do everything alone, so help us. If the Japanese government says that, we would probably begin to criticize the government. There are things the government can do and cannot do, and that should be made transparent and be discussed, and then the general public or the manufacturers can collaborate with the government. Is that what you're suggesting in terms of the relationship? Yes, uh, and the previous question about journalism also plays a big part here because journalism, especially investigative journalism, provide the very important context that shows the structural errors of the existing uh, interaction between stakeholders and also points out if each stakeholder can commit to do something together and then we can go better. And so this is uh, like mutual accountability. Everybody holds everybody else to account. And indeed, this is the only way forward for large scale digital transformation. But without an independent journalism um, sector, right, without an independent investigative journalists, then uh, nobody uh, is willing to share the kind of information that would privilege other stakeholders who will be suffering from the kind of uh, perverse incentive where people are incentivized not to share the information. But once the investigation by journalists is done and publicized, unlike a court investigation or a, a prosecutory, uh, prosecutory in investigation, a journalistic investigation is for public to understand. And once the public understand, it changed the norm. That is to say the expectation. And then all the stakeholders will be mobilized and incentivized to change. That has been true for pretty much all the collaborative meetings we held as part of the Open Government Task Force in the past more than uh, 90, I think almost 100 now, uh, cases that we have uh, processed. It's always engaging the civic media and also, uh, in most cases, the journalism sector. One other question about COVID-19, if I may. Earlier, well, this relates to a previous question. He would like to ask about some specific issue about vaccination. He mentioned that, well, we mentioned that getting a booking for vaccination is very difficult. My colleague has a very aged parent, and my colleague had to keep on calling all times. And also, we tried to let, uh, access the booking through the net here in Japan. But the elderly people in Japan, 
Nyamara, they were able to accept the digitalization. There are some that will never accept digitalization. So people who are left behind vis-a-vis -vis digitalization, what support can you render? What, what, what type of support are you providing in Taiwan to those people? Um, well, like my own uh, grandmother, uh, well, I have two grandmothers, uh, both alive, <laughs> but my, my uh, maternal grandmother, um, I think the carers uh, who uh, provide daycare service uh, from very beginning uh, have asked uh, for her willingness and the schedule and so on to get vaccinated. So she did not have to uh, learn any websites or any digital services and so on. Uh, and the same has been applied to, for example, social workers, uh, the nursing homes, and so on. So basically, while we do have a self-booking uh, vaccination uh, offering, that's actually the uh, a small percentage of the total available vaccine now. The major per percentage of vaccines is by bringing them to the people rather than asking people to register uh, for them. And that includes, I think, people over 65 years old, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you very much. My name is Mudura from Mainichi Newspaper Company, and thank you for joining this session. I have one question regarding vaccination. China. PRC against Taiwan is saying that if a political barrier is removed, the PRC is willing to provide vaccines to Taiwan. On the other hand, to the Latin American countries with whom Taiwan has diplomatic relationship, China is saying we will give you vaccine, but in exchange for you cutting off diplomatic relations with Taiwan. That's the demand PRC is demanding. So against vaccination, PRC seems to be politicizing this act of a provision of vaccines. How do you take that? Um, I, I'm not exactly sure this relates to digital systems. Uh, and so I, I may not be the most qualified person to answer this question. I would certainly say that uh, among my friends and families and so on, uh, they understand that the homegrown vaccines are probably the most safe bet, uh, which is partly why they did not get vaccinated back in April. Uh, but beyond that, uh, I think the Central Epidemic Command Center, as well as the Foreign Service uh, in Taiwan, is more qualified to answer because I only work on things like the, um, you know, the cross-country recognition of vaccination records uh, and so on. And these are the digital uh, parts of the question you ask. But the non-digital part, uh, I have no idea, really. Okay, point taken. Now, a question about diversity, if I may. Minister Tang, I've, I've tried, I've looked into your background. You entered the world, world of business at age of 15. In the 20s, you switched your gender. So you have, you have taken a look at different perspectives, I'm sure. Now, around the world, there are people who are found by long-standing traditions in their country and in their culture. They want to break free from that, but they can't. There are many people around the world who really cannot break free. It's especially, there are many young people who are very hesitant. Any message to these young people who are hesitant about breaking free? Uh, was that a question? Because Yes, yes. Okay, I heard. Any message to the young people who want to break free from these, okay. uh, something that bound them? Uh, okay. Um, I think the biology should not determine our destiny. That's my message to them. And having gone through two puberties personally, I do not have this conception in my mind that says half of the population is closer to me and half the population is less close to me. I don't have that. So this is what I mean by saying non-binary. And that is also a message, I guess, my personal uh, experience to share. Thank you very much. Another question is, this is completely unrelated from the previous topic. 
Mr. Tan, you seem to be interested in Japanese art, culture, and the activity of Japanese. Has anything intrigued you uh, in Japanese culture or Japanese people's uh, behavior? And if so, can you specify? Well, there's too many to, to list. Um, I, I, I would say that um, the resilience against not just earthquakes or typhoons and so on. I mean, the, the last two times I visited Japan, uh, both of them uh, I encountered typhoons. <laughs> There's something about my visits and typhoons, uh, one, one in Osaka uh, and uh, one in Okinawa. Uh, and I witnessed firsthand how orderly it is for the message, for the communication, for the preparedness. It's not like we can control the weather. We obviously cannot, but we can control our attitude toward such events. Uh, and I was very impressed. And so my, my point is that the resilience is not something that could be taught. It is something that is only learned. Uh, and when I visited Japan, I see this learned resilience very vividly. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, my name is Harima from TBS Television. I would like to ask questions. Thank you so much. I'd like to go, go back to the topic of the role of government and digitalization. So the role of government and the digitalization. I've been hearing your comments. Because of the progress in digitalization, it seems that the expectations, what is the role to be played by the government and the role to be played by the private sector probably has shifted as a result of digitalization. So policy setting, implementation, that process itself probably has undergone a major change because of the digitalization. That is my impression. So this major transformation and change. What is the most important principle in bringing about such transformation? Is it, is it transparency, do you think? Or is it diversity, allowing diversity of views, or, allow, or spirit of participation? What principle was most important in bringing about this transformation? What principle can we have in order to create organic relations between the government and the people? I would appreciate your advice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before answering the question, I would like to fact check myself. Between my uh, Okinawa typhoon visit and the Osaka typhoon visit, uh, I did visit like Tokyo and other cities, and uh, there was no typhoon during the uh, visits in between. So uh, fact checking. <clears throat> so back to the question. Um, I, I think uh, here the most important, at least to me, principle is about whether we conserve the possibility for future generations to innovate beyond our imaginations. And this is uh, what I call plurality. The uh, other, the opposite ideal of singularity says that whatever the current generation of technologists say, like, I don't know, replacing individuals with machines, replacing individual jobs with machines, smart cities instead of smart citizens, whatever vision that the designers uh, were having, if they adopt a singularity-based vision, then they would be essentially depriving future generations from contributing to the design space. But if we instead say, well, let's do assistive intelligence. Let's empower people closest to the pain. Let's spread the power to the edges. Let's make sure people trust the data storage. If they trust telecom, store their data there trust their municipality, store the data there, trust the shop owner and nobody else, store the data there. If we allow for dignity and agency under the idea of plurality, then we're not foreclosing our future generations from co-creating better. That is to say, we need to be humble in our design and always invite co-designers. Government, many governments used to dominate information and then decide on the policy. And after they decide on policy, they would 
communicate that to the general public. And that has been the procedure in planning policy and implementing policy. But you're saying social sector people should come uh, at the uh, very beginning stage. And what would be the biggest barrier to enable such a procedure? And what should be done in order to remove such a barrier? That's a big question for me. Any uh, clues? The old way of uh, how democracy works is limited, constrained by the communication technology of whichever time that a democracy was first designed for that polity. So when democracy is designed, when only pen and paper is possible, then you get voting, which is about three bits per person uploaded every four years, a very constrained upload bandwidth. Now, of course, afterward comes television and radio. So when the government decides something, it can use mass communication and work with professional journalists to contextualize it for the people, which is great. But it's not listening at scale, right? It's impossible for someone to listen to millions of people or for millions of people to listen to one another. So almost by definition, the decision is already done or almost done before it is pushed out to the public through the help of mass, mass communication and journalists. But nowadays, universal broadband is bidirectional. So anyone who has a better design can do what we in Taiwan call fork the government. Fork is um, like a fork, right? It's going to a different direction, taking what government has to offer, but providing it in a different way. Instead of PDF, uh, or fax machines use a interactive map. Instead of uh, waiting for people to tally the numbers of available vaccinations, well, use automated chatbots to help to do so. Instead of for people uh, to wait for their decision makers uh, to push out regulatory reforms, uh, ideate and sign 5,000 petitions uh, to push such reforms and set an agenda instead of the city councillors uh, making the budget for every year, uh, people can participate in participatory budgeting every month or whatever, right? So every single example I just said is based on the idea of bi-directional, multi-directional communication infrastructure. And universal broadband as a human right, if you do not have that, then you're essentially saying only the rich people who can afford this much bandwidth can participate in the democratic process. And it would not be very plural. It would not be very inclusive. So I would still argue this democracy uh, for this century is still predicated on not just the universal competence of digital and media, but also universal broadband access. Yes, Harry, yes, I just heard your comment. It's very clear. Your comment is very clear. Now, up until now, I suppose it could be said that up until now, up, up until this such time as policies are de determined, you don't want, to, it was more convenient for the government to inform the content of the decision. But in the new way, in the new era, from the, from the first stage, it's important that thoroughly information being publicized and that transparency of the process needs to be secured. Without that, as you mentioned, the deliberations cannot go forward. Is my understanding correct? That's entirely correct. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Okay. So I would like to ask another question, if I may. So we talk about digital transformation and digital divide. I want to ask about the digital transformation and digital divide. With digital transformation and digital revolution, many convenient things will spread. On the other hand, I'm sure you were successful you, when you worked in Silicon Valley. I think you were very, you gained a lot of money, hopefully. But with the digital transformation, digital revolution, a certain number of limited platformers and large digital companies and, and management became very rich. But on the other hand, you have people who are left behind. And in terms of social, uh, in terms of social income, there is a great divide now as a result of digitalization. But what type of measures do you think would be necessary to respond to the digital divide? Is it possible to resolve digital divide through digital means? Or do you think you need government policies to overcome the digital divide? 
what can we do? What can be done? I would appreciate your thoughts. Thank you. In addition to the universal competence in education, including lifelong education and healthcare and broadband, I think uh, another thing that we can do is to make sure that the technology come to the people. We make sure, for example, that in our 5G spectrum auction, a significant amount of the money goes to empower the most rural and remote places. So they are actually the most advanced. The urban places are still using 4G, but the remote places can already, for example, using the national healthcare app and virtualize their national health card through a QR code. Uh, and so they can access telemedicine, uh, telediagnosis, uh, even um, I think there's people experimenting with drones carrying uh, the pharmacy prescriptions and, and so on, uh, because there's a real need there, right? Public transportation is more costly there and so on. So by making sure that the state prioritizes social equity, we do not have to uh, experiment only with the rich people who can afford the latest gadgets. We can create a market where startups are incentivized to become social entrepreneurs. That is to say, innovators that solves this inequity with innovative means. It's like the uh, wing of social innovation to balance the wing of industrial innovation. In that sense, the role of the government will become even more important, I would assume. But when we look around countries all over the world, it seems that governments have not been so successful in narrowing down the digital divide. And they have not been successful in implementing policy that would contribute to the society. What is needed? Is it the people's side that ought to change, or is it the leaders that ought to change? What needs to be done in order for governments to be better respondent to the new digital world? How can they come up with better policies? Well, um, there's two different uh, roles at play here. There's the citizen's expectation of the government or the norm, as I mentioned. If the citizens expect the government to take care of everything, then the government do not have good input from the citizen for co-creation. And on the other hand, if the government doesn't trust the citizens with opportunities of co-creation, then the citizens would say, oh, of course, my time is better spent elsewhere than participating in public related affairs. So it's like a dance. Someone has to move first. So I always say the government need to trust the people first and demonstrate instead of uh, for example, responding through writing uh, 60 days after a petition is made, we take action immediately. For example, my email, uh, I usually reply to the email very quickly, well, except in the past week. But anyway, uh, I reply to my email very quickly. And so a few months ago, for example, there was a person who sent an email saying, um, Digital Minister Audrey Tang, you promised universal broadband as a human right but I'm in a quarantine place uh, near the Yangming Mountain, and this email took me an afternoon to send. There's no telecom with good reception in the quarantine place, and I have to spend 14 days there. I'm suffering from a lack of human right, and you promised uh, you can uh, take the blame, uh, and so I'm emailing it to you. And so I work with the telecom, the, the National Communication uh, Commission, and in just two weeks, we set up a new telecom tower near that quarantine place. So the situation is resolved. Of course, by that time, he's already out of quarantine. But he made a point of driving back using speed test to uh, hold me to account to, to see I have delivered my promise and share it on social media. And this took just two weeks. If it took two months or six months, people lose interest in participation. But because stories like this make around on social media, it incentivizes more people to participate. So it's a two-way communication between the government and the people. That's wonderful. Any other question? Yes, a related question, if I may. Well, you talked about universal broadband access. 
that's also this, uh, the foundation of democracy you mentioned. But having said that, in the past, as technology develops, each time democracy has changed alongside technology. Now, at this juncture, so you talk about two-way communication. I think that's that's very meaningful. And I think this two-way bidirectional communication is very important. This, this is going to bring about change. I understand now. But then the old-style politicians, old-style companies, we still have them. They still have the power, these old-style companies and politicians. And this new change could actually undermine their position. So you have this process of opposition, I'm sure. Do you think that democracy can progress in the face of this old-style opposition forces? At the end of 2014, when I was hired as a reverse mentor to the cabinet, I talked uh, in three public lectures to 300 people who are the most senior people in the public service. So they're career public servants, but they are the most highly ranked. There's exactly 300 such people in Taiwan, level 12 or above. And so um, at the end of my lecture, one of my three lectures, one of the uh, person, a uh, very senior public servant asked me, so what are you asking? Are you asking us to all resign so the younger people can take our place? And I answered, that is not what I'm asking. I am asking you to work with young people and treat them as your peers, as reverse mentors. Of course, you have a lot of wisdom that young people can learn from, but the young people also have a lot of new ideas and direction that you can learn from. And so what I'm asking is create positions that are your peers that does not take decades for the young people to, to go to, but rather like in my own office, my office is exactly one half senior public career service and one half experts from the outside. And the senior people in the public service come from more than 12 different ministries. Each ministry can only send one delegate, a secondment to my office at a time. So it's entirely horizontal. And when the secondment goes back to their ministry, someone else can take their place. And that person who left, uh, returned to their ministry, take this idea of co-creation back and foster a culture change there too. And so this is a entirely voluntary association, a very delicate balance where every person can learn something else from every other person and no single value or voice dominate. To create such a place is much more important than introducing any specific expertise into the public service. It's about time we need to close. Minister Adrian, thank you very much. Thank you for the great questions. Uh, live long and prosper.